want you guys today, hopefully, to walk away with some real, like, solid advice or, or some real practical advice on how you go about going after your one thing, whether it be in your business or in your life or um, whether it be for your health or, you know, whatever it is, and they talk about kind of applying this to different facets of your life. So, so Jay's going to give us some, some kind of practical advice, and he'll set the stage a little bit for anybody maybe that's not familiar with what the one thing is, and then we'll really dive in and talk about this. You know, here are ways that you can put this into practice on a daily basis, because that's really what it becomes, is a, you know, it becomes this something that you're doing every day to, to try to, to attain that, that one thing that you're after, ultimately. So you guys, you, you all know who this gentleman is. I, I never, like, he's the VP of publishing at Keller Inc. He's also, like, an executive at, at Keller Williams International, I think. And um, he, he's got his own real estate team. So he's a, uh, a master of many things. How does that look, Bob? Can you see my screen? It should be a cover of the book. Yep, I can see that thing. The one thing, the surprisingly simple truth Perfect. behind extraordinary results. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Jay, and then you guys may hear me pop in from time to time with a question. If you have a question, let us hear it in the in the questions box, and, and I'll jump in and just make a wreck of the presentation that Jay's about to give you guys about the one thing. Take it away, Jay. Awesome. Thanks, Bob. You know, when we talked about this beforehand, um, you suggested that we take a real practical approach to implementing the one thing. I know a lot of people on this call have probably heard the message before or they've heard about it from other people. And I call them yes buts. It's this idea you hear this message and you say, yes, but you know, that's not going to fit in my life or that would work for you but not for me. And so my goal in the presentation today is just talk in a really practical how-to level on how you fit your one thing, you know, this disproportionate attention to the things that matter most into your incredibly busy work life. So I'm going to just kind of, in case you haven't heard about the book, the first few slides, I'm just going to cover really quickly the goal of the book. Um, the challenge of life, as kind of Gary and I discussed it, was is that of all the things that you could know and all the things that you could do and all the things that you could have, you have to make a choice. And the modern life, though, especially in real estate, is list, to-do lists that are too long, calendars that are overbooked, Moms and dads that feel like they're, they're weighed down with obligations that force them to make tough choices between succeeding at work and succeeding at home. And this idea that we have to make a choice once you embrace it and have a tool for how to make better choices is actually quite liberating. Um, Bob, one of the things that I kind of shared with some friends the other day was I was looking at all the things I thought I had to do, and one of them was actually watch Downton Abbey. Everybody in my life, my mom, my dad, my sister, my boss, my coworkers seemed to be watching the show, and I didn't have room. And at one point, I literally had two full seasons of Downton Abbey on my DVR without having ever single watched an episode. And it was just carrying it around like an anchor, you know, this thing that I hadn't done. And I'll tell you, at some point while we were researching this book, I came into the office and Gary was telling me about the latest episode, and I said, Gary... I just want you to know, I deleted both seasons last night, and I've never felt better about my life. And <laughs> it's this idea that if I could only going to watch a handful of shows with my family, I know that's a great show. I'll get to it at some point, but I had to make a choice. So there's like a little life example. But to me, when I look at this graphic, the little triangles, the wedges, of all the things that you could know, do, or have, your life is going to be defined about what you actually choose. And you can run around and try to sample the whole pie, which is pretty much impossible. Or you can just say, you know what, I want to make a conscious choice. I'm going to make my life about the things that matter most to me. And that's what we're going to talk about today. What you get from that is what we call the domino effect. And we wanted that to be the metaphor for what, what comes from making a deeper investment in one thing. And the idea is that when you knock over the first domino, if you've ever lined them up, you can knock over a lot more. That one act can actually give you many multiples of the impact versus kind of knocking them all over individually. And one of the cool things that we discover when we are looking into domino runs is, first, the world record. Somebody out there actually set up 4.5 million dominoes and got them all to fall down, which 
just sounds crazy to me. I think it took 11 minutes for them all just to fall down after someone knocked over that first one. So lesson number one, when you do your one thing, not only will that one thing happen, but many things can come from it if you've got them lined up correctly. I and thought the lesson other number cool one thing, was going to be don't try to break the domino record. Are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Talk about like a lifetime hobby, right? Goodness. Of course, I'd be the guy who would walk into the room and slam the door and knock them all over <laughs> prematurely. Right. We all would. Um, We'd all be that guy. Yeah. Um, the other thing we call is there was an article in Scientific American in 1983 where this guy described this weird kind of factoid. It's one of those little things that, you know, he just discovered and thought was kind of cool. A domino can actually knock over another domino that's actually 50% larger. So a three-inch domino can knock over, you know, a two-inch domino, which is the actual site, can knock over a three-inch. And a three-inch can knock over a four-and-a-half-inch. And after that, my math kind of breaks down. <laughs> but the guy who did the experiment actually built them out of wood. And he built, um, I think he built seven or eight of them in a row. And the way he described it is that what began with a, a small tick ended with a loud slam. By the time you got to the eighth or ninth domino, it was as big as a door. And he just couldn't build them bigger than that after that, just a resource issue. So Gary and I kind of geeked out. And if you took that and you get a problem that's progressively 50% larger, when you see a geometric progression, and that's what it's called, it kind of blows your mind. By the 18th domino, it would be taller than the Tower of Pisa. By the 23rd, it would be way above the Eiffel Tower. By the 31st, it would be 3,000 feet above Everest, the tallest point on Earth. And just 57 dominoes into your run, you'd have a domino that reached almost all the way from the Earth to the moon. And so what we want to have happen for people isn't just a domino run. We want people to get a geometric progression. Um, scientists, Bob, they call this a hockey stick. Are you a hockey fan? Yeah, absolutely. Do you see the shape of the line underneath it? Do you see how that looks a little bit like a hockey stick? Yep. So anytime you have a geometric progression, it'll graph out that same way. What begins as almost too small to notice becomes almost so big you can't, almost can't get your mind around it. And it's a really important thing. And the lesson today is going to be about the habits that define us. A lot of times when we're trying to start, let's just say it's, the habit is eating better. For the first few weeks, you'll make a little progress. And then for a long time, it'll feel like nothing's happening. And then one day, someone will go, hey, you look really skinny. And you'll start to notice that you actually look physically differently. Your face looks different. The changes are really slow in the beginning. But on the tail end, they can really be magnified. And if you look at almost any discipline, whether it's playing the guitar, becoming really, really great at this game called real estate, a lot of times the investments we make in the things that are good for us, that work for us, are really, you don't get a lot of feedback in the beginning, but you do get a lot of feedback at the end. It's one of the reasons you can look at people at the start, and they might do two million in volume the first year, and they just get a little better, and maybe do four or five million the next year. And then you look up and five years into it, they're like Ben Kenny or Claudia Restrepo, Sue Adler, and they're doing 60 or 70 million, and they've only been in the business for like six or seven years. And it's because doing the right things over time adds up, and it can create a geometric progression. So that's kind of what we want to have happen for the people on this call. And the lesson I get from that is that success is sequential. You've got to line things up and make an investment in your future. Um, one of the things that people, when Gary teaches this book and they talk to me, they go, you know, it's kind of hard for me to identify with that guy. You know, he's in great shape. He's got a great diet. He's got a great marriage. He's got a great business. He's so good at so many things. And what I always want to tell them is you understand if you go back to the 40s, you can find pictures of Gary when he was very overweight and unhealthy. That the things that he's, he looks to be doing so well at today, he lined them up one at a time and tackled them one at a time. And that's how he ended up farther down the road looking like he's kind of really good at a lot of things. When in fact, he just kind of built them progressively one at a time. And I'll revisit this at the end because the main message I would have for people is as we look at the different areas that you can apply this book to your life and your business, you'll probably have answers for a lot of these. But just attack one and make a stand around that. I got an email from one of the senior vice presidents at Citibank today, and he let me know 
that as a result of reading the book, he's already lost 20 pounds. He's working out five times a week with his wife where he's been doing it, not at all. And he's gotten himself on a 1,600-calorie 16, 1600 calorie a day diet. And he says it's just changed that one thing, focusing on his health, has changed everything for him. It's made his marriage better. It's made his business better. And that's a perfect example of someone implementing this book, picking one battle to fight, and then seeing the halo effect of creating one really positive habit in your life. So here's the tool at the center of the book. It looks pretty humble, but I'm going to break it down for you. It's called the focusing question. Um, and we could go in if we had a lot more time, but this came out of Gary's consulting with top agents and business owners and brokers across the U.S. over many, many years. He just would keep asking them, you know, at the end of the consulting call, so what are you going to get done this week? And have an agreement. And they would list just a handful of things, right? These are business owners. They're focused. And then the next week, they get back on the phone, and Gary would discover that while they had done some of the things, they didn't do all of them. And they certainly all, almost always avoided the number one thing, and he got frustrated. So he said, well, if there are only three things that you could do this week, such that by doing it, everything would be easier or unnecessary, what would they be? And then they would do the two that were maybe the second and third thing. So he'd make it two things, and that would still frustrate him. And it was finally almost in kind of parental anger, he said, look, if there's just one thing that you could do this week, such that by doing it, everything would be easier or unnecessary, he would, what would that be? And then he would hold them accountable to the answer. And here's the funny thing. When someone agrees to do just one thing and they have a whole week to do it, there's no place to hide. The next week is just a yes or no. You can't say, but I did this instead. And what he noticed is that the moment he narrowed people's focus down to one thing, their results went through the roof. By focusing on the most important thing and making a battle stand around that, so many other good things were happening as a result, and that's all he had to focus on. And that's really where this question comes from. And we asked people in the beginning, this, is, this would be your first habit to start asking this question at the beginning of your day, the beginning of your week, the year, year. What's the one thing I can do today or this week or this month such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary? Well, let me just kind of break this down just a little bit more. What's the one thing I can do? It's not two things. It's not three things. It's one thing. You're asking your brain to come up with an answer for one thing, and it's what you can do. And like great, the great Shel Silverstein said, it's about what you can do, not what you could or should or would because all the coulda, woulda, shouldas all ran away and hid from one little did, as the poem goes. You want to look for things that you can do right now. You like that, Bob? Do you read poetry to your kids? Yeah, yeah. Shel Silverstein, you're bringing me back to, like, my youth. <laughs> I love following up about the girl who throws up. You know, that's awesome. Those poems made me laugh when I was a kid. <laughs> so what's the one thing I can do? Such that by doing it, all that says is, you don't just do one thing. The one thing that you're going to, you're going to, your answer is going to be a levered approach, that doing this one thing, something else happens. Another domino is going to fall down. And the scale of that is hopefully geometric. By doing this one thing, by tackling this one challenge, this one area of focus, everything else is here and necessary. The scale of it is as big as your mind can imagine. And so by asking that question, in our experience, one, most people already know the answer and they're either avoiding it or they don't have trust in it. And I guess the, the second message for you today would be to start trusting your answers. I've probably taught this book 30, 40 times this year, and without fail afterwards someone will email me or send me a, a note on Twitter or on Facebook and said, this is the challenge, this is what I want to have happen. It could be a challenge or an opportunity. I think my one thing is this, what do you think? And they're looking for validation. And honestly, it's their answer, and most of the time it seems really reasonable to me. And who would I be to question it? I would tell you, if you think you know the answer, just jump in and try it out. And if it's not, then ask the question to get in and try something else. That's what top achievers do. They don't get caught up researching things for six months. They just get into action in the best action that they can possibly conceive at that moment. So you go out and you find your answer. And then we want you to build a habit around it. So here's where we're going to now. There's our preamble. There's our setup. That's what the one thing is, right? It's the levered action to get the results you need. And what I'd like to do now, Bob, with your permission, is I want to go through the seven circles. That's what I refer to this, the seven areas of the people's lives. 
in kind of an order of priority and share how you can ask the question in each of them. And I'm actually going to share on this call what me and my wife are doing in each of these areas. Absolutely. What our That's one thing fantastic. is. Yeah, go for it. And well, Yeah, it's fun, and I enjoy this part. But it's not about being prescriptive. What I really would caution people from doing is taking our answer and then just making that theirs. There's nothing magical about it. It's just where we were at the time we asked the question. And we said, you know what, let's run with that but it hopefully will be instruct and give you a sense of how this plays out in the real world. So if you go to the 12 o'clock position, you have spiritual life. And Gary and I agreed that if you don't know the answer there, what else should you be focusing on? And a lot of people um, either already know their answer or they've avoided it. And a lot of times that can create kind of an existential crisis later in life. So you might as well just go ahead and ask it and answer it. What's the one thing I can do for my spiritual life, such that by doing it, everything else will be easier and necessary. Um, we've got an app that I'll share later. And what's funny is spiritual and physical one things are the top two things that people are tackling as a result of reading this book. So the answer that Wendy and I came up with, we've got children, Gus and Veronica, age nine and seven. And we had already established a habit, right? And I'm going to keep hitting that, a habit of eating dinner together as a family. Wendy and I read a lot of research said that families that eat together with the TV off and actually, even if it's for 10 minutes, have to actually talk to each other, tend to be much healthier families. So a long time ago, we started making that a habit. And our kids just know it's about 6.30, it's dinner time, and we eat at the table together. And I've made a stand about being home for that, and I've organized my work around that. So we have this really solid habit to build from. We wanted to add another one. So we've established the habit of gratitude. And this is not a, a religious thing, and I think it's a spiritual one. We go around the table, and I say, Gus, what are you thankful for? Veronica, what are you thankful for? Wendy, what are you thankful for? And sometimes I ask Gus or Veronica to lead this discussion. And we just say, well, you know, like right now, like Gus is really into Legos. He's really into Halo on his Xbox. So he's, he might say thanks for that. Veronica's really into our cat, and she's really into dragons. You know, so I'm thankful for dragons. When they're sucking up, they might say mom and dad. <laughs> and then I mean, Wendy will role play family or this house we get to live in. Or, you know, we, we can be a little instructive. And our thinking was is that if people made a habit every day and we could instill this into our children, of just being grateful for what we have, that that's a really, really helpful spiritual thing for them. Um, I know that it, it, it can help people avoid depression. It didn't just be grateful for being here. The gift of life itself, you know, we all woke up on this side of the ground. That's, at, at the very least, we have that to be thankful for. So that was our first habit, and that's pretty well instilled. It's funny, I had Sean Kokoska, who leads our coaching program around the book, over to the house with his kids, and, you know, it felt a little weird, because I don't always say, let's hold hands and, you know, give thanks when we have other people there, but Gus did it. He goes, well, what's everybody thankful for? And everybody went around the room, and we just said what we were thankful for. And it's cool because Sean said that they're doing that now at their table. So number two, physical health. Um, Bob, you may have known this because we've run into each other a few times, but I had back surgery a few years ago. Yeah. So I've had some real physical challenges. I, was, you know, I weighed 210 now, but I weighed way over 240 at one point. And I just I couldn't move around. You know, my back was killing me. Um, so the surgery... I've had a series of one things for my health. Last year, my wife and I kind of came up with a new one that we could do together, and we're still doing it. And we have small children. We can't leave them at home alone. We wanted to work out together. So our solution was to have a trainer come to our house three times a week. And that's our one thing, and we make a stand around it. And unfortunately, if you want to work out for an hour and you want to do it before your kids are awake, the trainer shows up between 5 and 5.30, and I'll tell you, I'm a night owl, so that's been a tough adjustment, but it's what we needed to do to make that habit happen. We were placed on our calendar that we could control the time, and we had a choice between the evening or the morning, and I felt more comfortable going for the morning because the evening, I just didn't know what would happen, and I didn't want to miss time with my kids, reading to them in bed, so we did it in the mornings. And it's, it's improved not only our health, we both lost tons of weight and are in better shape, but it's actually improved our marriage. 
And so that's our second one thing. You know what's funny, Jay? As you, as you continue yeah. to go around this, like each one is already having an impact on the ones you haven't even talked about yet, right? Like, like Absolutely. your decision on your physical health to, to, to do something about that, like you're saying it's made my marriage better. Like it's already dripping into your personal life before you've even looked at and focused on something in your personal life. That's exactly true, and I think that's got a lot to do with how Gary wanted us to organize them. You know, if you don't have your spiritual questions answered, it can definitely bleed into all the other areas of your life and color them. You know, if your health is not in order, you know, first off, where are you going to live, right? Um, that's your body. That's your house on this earth. And, you know, having energy for work and for your relationships and all those other things, those are, it's a really powerful foundation to build under everything else. And so, yeah, we did put a lot of thought into it. And if our circles aren't in the right order, people can feel free to move them around. But that was the idea. Um, my personal life, you probably know this because you've got, um, you know, a, a young child as well. But when we had, we had two kids um, 17 months apart. And for about three years, our world was defined by diapers. <laughs> and... You know, we had a colicky child. We didn't get a lot of sleep. Um, super challenging for our marriage. And my wife also happens to be my best friend, you know, the person I want to hang out with the most. And so somewhere around, I don't know, nine or ten months into the journey, um, Gary actually suggested this. He goes, you know, y'all should have a date night. And I was like, what's that? <laughs> and he goes, pick a day of the week, and every week make a stand around getting a babysitter. And so... After a lot of experimentation, we've settled on Wednesday nights. And it's funny. Everyone in my life knows that Wednesday night is date night. There's people on Facebook that knows that Wednesday night is date night and ask me what we're doing. But first off, it's really easy to get a babysitter on a Wednesday night because we tried Fridays and Saturdays, and it was too much work. And if we couldn't get a babysitter, then we couldn't make the habit stick. But now Wednesdays is pretty much our regular gig. And we go to the movies. We go to dinner. But that's the one thing we do. Like, we never go longer than a week remi without reminding us why we got married and had these ragamuffin children in the first place. We get to get back together and back in touch with that, and it's been huge for our life. Um, you know, the one that I'm I've been the most at and I've been failing at the most is my key relationships. Um, most people don't know this because I do public speaking, and they see me in front of all these people and say, well, he must be a real extrovert. Actually, if you show, I showed them like my behavioral assessments, like the DISC or the Myers-Briggs. I'm actually defined by how introverted I am. I just happen to be an author, and this is a skill I had to learn. So I kind of love people from a distance, including my close family and friends. And earlier this year, I went to a funeral of a colleague, and um, the brother of the deceased stood up there, and he was an introvert, and he started sharing stories about his younger brother, and it struck a chord with me because he shared with us that he had deep regret that now that his younger brother was suddenly gone, very unexpectedly, that it was always his younger brother that was calling him, and he was never the one picking up the phone to call his brother. And that really, really tore me up because I was like, that's me. All my friends have to call me. My mom has to chase me. She calls my cell phone. She emails me, Facebooks me, and then, you know, tries the home phone until she gets me because she knows that, like, when I come home for work, I just want to go into this little family cocoon. And if she's not there, she misses out on that. And so I actually have a coach now, um, one of our MAPS coaches, and one of the things he holds me accountable to is I have to call two friends every day. I know that sounds ridiculous to a lot of people on the call, like an incredibly low prospecting goal, but given who I am, that's where we decided to start. I wanted to build the habit of success before failure, and I'm still not even succeeding. I, think, I don't think I've made it an entire week where I've called two people every day. And it's just a huge challenge for me because it runs counter to my nature, but I know every time I do it that I'm doing the right thing and it feels right. And I can't call people for business. This has to be a purely social call. So there you go. There's the one that I'm completely upside down on. Um, the big one, oh, did you want to say something, Bob? Well, I just, when you get upside down like that on on this thing and you, and you realize, like, you, you're, you're putting effort into, like, this is my one thing, and you get upside down on it, how do you, 
how do you not let that get in the way of, of realizing that at some point a, a habit will form? Does that question make sense? It does. It does. In, 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 in the next slide or two, I'm going to walk through kind of how habits are formed because that's a big okay. part of what I'm talking about. It's not just that you just do it out of willpower or determination. At some point, it becomes kind of a habit, and you don't have to work at it nearly so hard. Okay. You know, I just I, I remind myself why. I mean, I just, every time I teach this, and I've gotten to where I don't choke up, the first three or four times I told the story of the funeral, it hits mm -hmm. me so deep I could almost not yeah. talk. You get me a little bit I'm, up over here. I mean, that, that, probably a lot of people on the call, you, that's a, you know, we don't have so much time on the earth, and we don't know when it's going to end, right? Right. I mean, and honestly, and there's, you know, the geek in me says there's lots of research, but we all know it in our heart. The only thing that really matters at the end of the day is the relationships. Yeah. It doesn't matter what books I write. It doesn't matter how many homes our team sells. None of that actually matters at the end of the day. What matters is the relationships that we've built. And so for me, I, I get back in touch when I'm failing, and my coach, my coach reminds me that there's really something at stake here that matters, and it's worth, it's worth struggling through. And I'll muddle through. It's just a challenge because this is one of the things where I pick something that I knew would be challenging, and it's not something that I'm going to naturally do well. So my wife's supporting me. Um, I have friends. When they pick up the phone, they go, am I one of your two calls? And they make a joke about it now. And I'm like, yes, aren't you happy I called you? <laughs> and um, we laugh about it, but it, it takes some of the pressure off. Um, I'll kind of work through these last three so we can get into some of the mechanics of why all these things and how it all works. But for my job, um, we talk about this big time in the book, whatever is the one thing for your job and for real estate, Bob, you know the answer. What's the one thing that is the most meaningful to success in real estate? Lead generation. Absolutely right. Ding, 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 you win a prize. Lead <laughs> generation. It doesn't matter how good you are at listing homes or working with buyers. You'll never get to prove it if you don't have customers, period. That's the nature of the business we're in. And the people who are most successful put the most focused time on finding leads. So we tell people to block four hours a day. And it's a huge amount of time, and it will throw your work life out of balance, and it will be stressful and all those things. But that's how all those good things start happening. And Gary and I, our one thing, our lead generation is through these books. And I'll tell you, for five years, we were either blocking four hours a day for five days or because we couldn't make Mondays work at one point because we had too many staff meetings, we went six hours a day on four. And that added up to the same number of hours a month dedicated to our one thing. So we knew that we always had the pedal to the metal and the thing that would matter most to our careers. So it's four hours a day. And I'll, I'll show you a calendar in a couple of slides here on how we've slotted that in. For our businesses, and I guess I'm now active in about four businesses that have a meaningful impact on our lives. I mean, my day job and then ownership in these others. And the one thing for us is people. Um, we have a great class in our company called Recruit Select, and we invite people to it all the time. But I've probably been to it now nine or ten times. Um, and my goal this year, there's actually a, all these habits I'm describing, there's only two new ones. And I introduced them at different times, so I wasn't, I wasn't stretching myself too thin. One of the other new ones was that I made a commitment to try to meet with one talented person every week. Again, talk about low goals, just one person. But for a writer that spends a lot of time in, I call it my cave, my writing area, which is just books, not people, it's a big deal for me. So I had to get really proactive. I had to get into my database, start asking people, you know, who do they know? And now I've got it kind of systematized such that I have this window on Wednesdays, and I can just kind of show up and ask my assistant, who am I talking to today? And so sometimes it's a phone call, and sometimes I meet them for coffee. And it's amazing how that's paid off, because I'm looking for people long before I actually need them in my business which is a very different way. It's kind of like if you remember back when you were single, when you were out and you weren't actually looking for a girlfriend or a boyfriend, you actually came off as much more attractive to the other side than when you were desperate. I and mean, then you've seen people that were that way. And so when you're out there and you're not, you have no agenda other than just getting to know talented people, they start to show up. And that actually showed up in our business just this last week. I met a guy in Nordstrom's. He was a salesperson. We started talking real estate, and I thought, man, this kid's talent. 
he's not even out of college yet, but he's going to be a superstar. And I had no agenda, no place in my business. I gave them a behavioral assessment. I invited them to a couple of seminars. We had our, our Wednesday meeting, and I just kind of started staying in touch very passively. And we just had a position open up on his team, and we hired him this week. But that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had this whole lead generation process. We had an opening on our team. We never had to post a job posting or anything. He was already there on the bench waiting. So people, and I've, my goal is to meet with 50 talented people this year, and I'm on track. Uh, and then the last one is finances, and this dates back all the way to 2004 when we wrote The Millionaire Real Estate Investor. You know, Gary was really clear that the measure, the thing that you measure on a regular basis is net worth. And so every month for years, Wendy and I would get out a spreadsheet, and we would add up all the things that we owned and all the things that we owed and figure out what our net worth. That's the difference. How much do you assets, liabilities, and subtract those, and you get your net worth. And in the beginning, it was a very, very, very small number. <laughs> in fact, it was a negative number the first time we did it. We actually had to count some clothes and furniture to try to make it positive. But we kept doing it and kept doing it and focusing on it. And by focusing on that number, we changed our spending habits, our saving habits, and how we invested our money. And that number is very, very different today. And most of the basis for it happened before any either of us were making a good salary. Um, our combined household income, both working full time, is still less than 100000 when we laid the base for what we have today. And we just made better decisions. So like a tip for those on the call, if you're looking to do that and you don't want to do a spreadsheet, because I promise you it was painful, there's a free service called Mint, M-I-N-T dot com. Mm -hmm. It's associated with Quicken. And we just took all of our accounts up to that, and once a month we log on and it tells us the number. And that's been a lifesaver for us. So Bob, when I go through all those seven, do you have any questions before we kind of move on to the kind of how to put this stuff on your calendar? Nope, I don't got any questions. I, I interjected mine while we were going there. Awesome. Um, right, well, it, to me, it's, it's pretty, I don't know, a lot of people sit on the call, I wonder if people think like looking at that is massive, but it, in listening to you explain it, this is something you've been doing for six years, essentially. For seven, a while, right? I mean, it wasn't something where, like, all of a sudden one day you said, okay, I'm going to do my one thing for every aspect of my life, and, and I'm going to learn seven new habits. Like, this is something that you've done over a, over a long period of time. Absolutely. And some of it we did before we knew what we were doing, honestly. We just right. kind of were following coaching advice from our mentors and saying, oh, this would be a good thing to, to do. I didn't even use the language of building habits. So when we got to the end of the book, I looked up and I asked, what are our power habits in these areas? I realized, and in some of them, we had a really good one that we just needed to maintain or add to maybe just slightly, but there were only a couple of real gaps. And for me, that was in my key relationships and in that business area where I just, because again, I'm introverted, I wasn't really bringing new talent into my network. And so in the last 12 months, those are the only two really new habits I've been focused on. And until I close them up, I probably am not going to add another one, just because that's what our research shows is it's just really hard to double up. Uh, so knowing your answer and doing it, obviously, are very, very different things. And here's kind of our magic formula. You ask the focusing question and get your answer. We want you to make it a habit. And I keep coming back to that word. Because you have to work to form a habit, but after that, the habit works for you. And the example I tell people is brushing your teeth. Because I've got small kids, I can tell you it takes years of berating by a parent to actually get people to form the habit of brushing their teeth twice a day. And they will lie to you. Did you brush your teeth? Let me smell your breath, right? <laughs> and I don't know what the battle is about. But then there comes a point, I don't know about you, but it's unconscious for me. I just stumble into the bathroom in the morning when I'm barely caffeinated and know that I have to brush my teeth. And it happens. It's almost automatic. So you want to make whatever it is that you need to be doing a habit. And it takes a little work, and then it works for you. You want to time block it, and then you have to check that time. So really quickly, how long does it take to form a habit? For years, I heard it was 21 days, and it's just completely unfounded. The most recent research that we found for the book is that on average it takes 66 days to form a habit. And they, they surveyed all of these uh, graduate students trying to form health habits for a year. 
And the reality is some of them formed a habit in 18 days, meaning they would ask them, did you do it every day and how hard was it? And when it got as easy as it was ever going to get is when they said, that's the habit. And then for some people it took almost 200 days. And so you look at that and you realize 66 is a good guideline, but you'll also know, like when I was starting to work out in the mornings, I knew I was forming a habit when I started waking up before the alarm clock went off. I was like, oh, wow, I'm already awake. It's not, I don't have to cuss and, and, and throw the alarm clock across the room today. I actually, my body has now acclimated to this new habit. So what you're looking for is that magic point where a lot of the discipline and effort falls off. Here's a tip that we didn't write about in the book that I've since learned from a guy named B.J. Fogg, who runs the, the Behavior Design Lab at Stanford University. When you're adding your new habit to your lifestyle, attach it to an established one. And it's a fill in the blank. After I blank establish habit, I will blank new habit. And he's literally gotten tens of thousands of people to start flossing their teeth by saying, after I brush my teeth, I will floss one tooth. The simplest possible start, a really small goal to establish the habit and then build on it. It's that simple because hopefully everybody was already brushing their teeth twice a day. That became the trigger for them to do the next thing. And I tell you, in my experimentation as a human guinea pig, that really works. So you think about those things, and then you move to your calendar. And what we want you to do is think about it as an appointment with yourself. Maybe the most important, most important appointments that you could have. And I say that because most people's calendars are all about appointments with other people. But if you, people say, hey, I want to do something with you at this time, and that's when you're doing your one thing, I just want you to say, hey, I'm sorry, I've already got another appointment. Can we do it another time? Nobody's going to ask you who you're meeting with. And it's an incredibly effective script for dodging people, you know, getting them from removing your one thing from your life. The big three that we talk about time blocking, as it lays out in the book, are your time off, because this is a burnout industry. Gary starts every year with six weeks of vacation planned, even if he has no idea where he's going. And it may be a week out before he finally decides whether he's taking it or not. But up until that time, when you try to book that time, he says, you know what, I've got vacation planned. Can we do it before or after? He just put it on there as a placeholder for having it recharge. You're going to time block your one thing for work, and we tell people to do it in the morning, if at all possible. Gary and I try to write from 10 to 2, and we try to keep that as strict as we could. If we could do it at 8 to 12, we would do that in a heartbeat. But we both have big businesses and staff that we have to kind of unwind, clear the decks, and get into that room. And then at least once a week, set aside 30 minutes or an hour, and look at your calendar and make sure that your one thing or one things, as it were, are on it. So I kind of hinted at this, and this is the new slide that nobody's seen. This is kind of the way my week looks with all those seven habits. You know, on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I've got my health habit, the workout, first thing. Every day, I try to do it early because it might take me all day. I at least think about who I'm going to call and try to get those calls in. I try to do that. I've got a little window between 8 and 8.30 where most business days I have no official commitments. Then I have, on Wednesdays, I have my appointment with talent, right? That's my business one thing. I've got a little hour blocked off from 9 to 10, and that's just reserved on my calendar for the whole year as a place where I can slot talent. Hey, can you do this Wednesday? No, well, what about next Wednesday? Well, what about the next Wednesday? And I just work my calendar out that way until you get booked out. In my morning time, right, it bleeds a little bit into the afternoon, we do our one thing, which is writing. And if you looked over to the right side of the screen there, you'll notice that on Saturdays, and that's typically when we did it, sometime in the afternoon when the kids were napping or when they were off playing or on a play date, Wendy and I would sit down and we'd try to go through our net worth. You know, how is the business doing? Where is our cash going? And we would go over that. And that, frankly, is monthly. That's a habit that happens not daily or weekly, but monthly. In the evening, as I described, we have our dinner as a family, and that's when we do our spiritual habit. And then the last thing that you'll see at the bottom of the page on Wednesday nights, that's date night, and that's my personal life, right, where Wendy and I get together and go out. But each time we had to put one of those, add something to it, I just looked at my week and I said, where, where can we, I didn't do it alone, we did it together, where can we slot this in? 
and I'm looking for two things, something to trigger, if possible, can I attach it to an existing habit, and can I put it in time that I can actually control? The real challenge that people have is they try to build habits at times where they don't actually control their time. The biggest mistake, and I've, I've got a lot of friends who are personal trainers, is people try to work out in the evening. And what they don't know, even if they think it's an established habit, is they're missing a little. And it's because some days they have just a crappy day at work, and all they want to do is go home and sit in front of the tube and veg out. Or they want to go unwind with some friends at a local pub. But they miss workouts because of what happened during the day. And the people who are most successful move that forward in the day. So. That's kind of like, to me, when I was building this and sharing it with a few friends, it was an effective way to kind of communicate a lot. Look for blank spots on your calendar or create them and just say, it's 30 minutes, it's 15 minutes. If I can't give it a full hour, I'm going to take this sliver of time and start building a stand around it. And again, and you pointed this out, Bob, I started this year and five of the seven and we're already on my calendar as established habits. So it's only been over the course of the year that I've added to it. If we did this for Gary, he would be pretty similar, actually, in some ways. He's got a few more habits in there. He practices guitar. He's got some rituals with his mom where he goes and visits and spends time with her. But he just keeps layering on and layering on and building time for those things that he thinks are most important. So I'm going to do one more slot here. But I'm going to jump past that and talk about protecting your time block. And this is kind of where the rubber hits the road, because you've got it on your calendar, and then you've got this huge challenge. Um, build a bunker. Find a place for your work one thing where you can actually be undisturbed for a period of time. And for me, that's an office with the door closed. But if you walk through our building, you'd see people with like shower curtains over their cubes. I talked to one lady who would go take a rolling suitcase with her laptop on top of it and sit in a public training room in her office. And she would stop 10 feet from her actual office where her staff was and do her calls in the morning. Because she knew that if she went in there, there were too many temptations. She would hear people on calls and want to correct them. And she would sit there in a very public space, which is kind of the opposite of what I go for, and do all of her one thing work. So wherever that is, find it. Store provisions. I've got like a bowl of power bars. I've got aspirin. I've got medicine. I've got water. I've got everything I need in my office so that when I'm doing my one thing, I don't have to interrupt myself. If you've ever had one of those days, Bob, where you were just nailing it, you're working on this awesome blog, you hop up to grab some coffee, and then you see like three employees making a beeline towards you across the building like, ah, I was hoping I would see you. And we call that getting sniped. You know, you stepped out of your bunker and you got sniped. And it's tough because now you have to say no to a friend or a colleague or work out some sort of compromise so that you can get back into your one thing. So, I mean, if you actually looked at Gary's backpack he takes with him, he's got all of that stuff with him at all times. So if he gets in a productive place, he can just stay in the groove and get things done. Um, sweep for minds, and this is a big one for the people on our call. I've got two screens on my computer, and I have to do research. And I have to turn a lot of stuff off. I close buzzer I use um, for social media, so I won't be tempted while I'm writing my book. I use a browser with no bookmarks in it, because really all I need is Google. I turn off my cell phone. I've turned off all of those little announcements that buzz in throughout the day and little dinosaur games that my kids play. And so I just kind of get all of that out of my environment for that period of time. And the last one is enlist support. And I know I'm just racing through those, because I want to open it up for some questions from the audience. But if you just ask the people around you, whatever your one thing is, hey, family, I'm going to start getting up early to start running because if I don't lose weight now, I'm going to be, you know, 50 when I'm 42. Or I need to, you know, have this hour or two at work where I can really focus on making my calls. If you just ask these magic words, it's four words, I need your help. Most people that you actually want to stay in relationship with will respond positively to that and they will come to your aid. I actually had an assistant that for years, if she saw me dilly-dallying when I was supposed to be doing my one thing, she would come take that work away from me. Give me that. You need to be writing. And I was happy that she did it. I let her be my boss in that moment. She was coming to my aid. Because a lot of days, you just have a rough day and you don't want to do it. 
And the goal of all of this is if you can build some momentum, you just start Xing off those days. I did my one thing. I did my one thing. Eventually, you'll get to this place where, you know, I've got 66 days in a row, and you'll build a habit, and it'll start working for you. So um, we actually have a tool for that, Bob. It's the app. That the one thing, it's free. But you can go on there, create your one thing in these areas, and then it'll send you texts and emails to remind you to do it. So that's it. That's like the last of my prepared speech. Fire away. Knock some holes and yes buts in it. Okay, I, I, have a, I have a question. So go back to the slide for me that's got the different categories. Um, so like your spiritual life, your... The seven areas. Okay, so we've got seven areas. What would be your suggestion? Let's say that that I've got some, like, as I look at this, I've got what I believe to be some strengths, and then I've got some just real, real weaknesses where I, I really haven't focused on that at all. Does it make sense to, to, to do this from the perspective of let me, so, so I'm going I'm to adopt this philosophy. Should I adopt it for the thing, for first, for the things I'm already strong at? and really build that and just make sure that I've got that dialed in? Or does it make sense to start somewhere where I realize that I'm completely and utterly lacking and, and, and do something for, for one of these seven areas where, where I'm doing nothing, really? Well, you know, I'm glad we're not in the same room because you might want to punch me in the shoulder. But here's, and I'm not being smart, Alecky. If I were you, I would say, I've got these four things I'm, I'm, I'm strong at. And here's my one thing. I've got these three things where I could use some work. And this is what I think my one thing is. I just ask the question, of these seven things, what's the one thing I could do such that by doing it, it would make everything easier or unnecessary? And start with that thing. I bet you know the answer. And it might be, you know what, I need to stay in my, my groove. I need to focus on this thing that I've got already outsized talent. Because if I just do that, it will cover up everything else. And there are people who literally do that in a lot of areas. So ask the question, and if you can build on a habit by making it bigger or, you know, I'm going to take my four hours and make it five hours a day, get that done until it's a habit and then ask the question again and go on to the next one. Um, I don't want to wade into the debate about working and focusing on your strengths versus weakness because I think it's a great debate to have. Most of the time for my children, which means I should take this advice myself. I want them emphasizing their strengths. And if you listen to my speech, I've got a couple of key weaknesses around networking. And the, the, the reason I'm focusing on them is they will, in the end, hold me back. And I'm not willing to accept that. Okay. So Beth made a comment that um, loves the idea of what you're grateful for. In their family, they call it stressed and blessed. So they go around and talk about the things they were blessed with today and the things they were stressed with. And I think that makes sense, right? Like you can a little, little bit of that stress out. That's a, <laughs> that's a great comment. That's cool. Um, okay, so Joanne wants to know, where is the app available? So it was app.theonething.com. Is that right, Jay? And maybe Carrie could, could throw that link out for everybody. So app.theonething.com. Let me ask um, calendar. And it's the one thing with the number one. Um, and if you just go to the website, you can click on a few links and find it. But that's where it is. Okay, so app. Let me. I'll send it out. Oh, Carrie can do it. Um, what for? In terms of calendaring, what do you use? Like practically, we're using Google Calendar, or what kind of calendaring system do you use? I'm I'm kind of always been the tech guy in our writing partnership, right? It's also, it's not only a generational thing. It's just where my interest is too. So, you know, I've got everything. I've got a Google Calendar that I share with my wife, and it's synced to my Outlook Calendar. And I've got my, you know, it's all synced to my iPhone and my iPad. Um, one of the things I made a switch to earlier this year, and I'm experimenting with, and so far it's been really positive, I had an issue with that. I knew that I was going to have a really crazy year with the book coming out. And when I look at my phone, I see a few hours of time. And I don't have any context for what's around it, at least not easily. I know that you can kind of click through, but it tends to give you this hyper small focused look at what you're doing that day or that week, but it's hard to get beyond that. So Gary offered and I accepted and I just bought a month at a glance calendar for the year. And I didn't copy everything over to it because that's now I'm, I'm managing two calendars. But what I did is at the beginning of each month, 
I look at it and I've got my one thing for work on there. I've got my meeting times with my key people, right, the planning time, and maybe a handful of other big things like people's birthdays that I know I have to do something special on. And everything else was on my Outlook. But I use that and I look at that before I accept new appointments on my software calendar. It, earlier this year, I got invited to Book Expo, which has been a dream of mine. You, you can literally walk away with hundreds of free books, like it's a book lover's dream. And I got invited to speak. And I started to say yes, and I stopped myself because I was looking at my Outlook calendar. I pulled my paper calendar out and looked at it, and what I realized was that if I had said yes, I was going to be gone the night before we were celebrating my son's birthday. Now, in my defense, we weren't celebrating it on his birthday because we were going to be traveling. We were celebrating it two weeks early. So it would have never occurred to me if I hadn't broken that out and gotten a bigger frame of reference for my time. And I was able to maneuver that, that conference to an earlier date so I could do both. So I kind of like it. You know, the things that I want to achieve at are big. And it takes a big reference on time. I need to see how many writing days do I have this week, this month, and understand it in context but towards my big goals. So I'm totally fine with Google calendars and all of that, but I've actually brought this kind of archaic paper calendar back into the mix. Interesting. And you call yourself the tech guy of the team. Is that? I've got a, yeah, yeah. I'm going to buy a new iPhone today, dude. I'm all over it. So. Are you? Wait, did it, it, it didn't come out today, did it? They're announcing it today. So hopefully you can pre-order okay, so it today. It'll be, so it'll, it'll, it'll oh, pre-order. Okay, got it. I was, I was just say you're not going to be like one of those guys down there standing in line for, you got that on your calendar? You stand in line for the next <laughs> no, six no. hours for the iPhone? No, I've still got an iPhone 4, man. I am so ready for an upgrade. I'm just so, I'm, so, I'm too much of a cheapo to, to have upgraded in between. Me too, me too, Jay. All right. Um, Here's, so how do you, and I think I, maybe I know the answer to this already, but so sometimes, how do you balance all of this stuff? I mean, is it, is it as easy as I time block it? Like, is that the answer to finding balance between, you know, all of these different things? I just try to make sure that they don't clash into each other as much as possible. So when I sit there and I think about, well, if, you know, and, and, and I'm just, you can't be that anal all the time, right? So most of this kind of fit within a natural framework for when I might be doing it. You know, we're going to be grateful at dinner time. We were already doing that. Tonight was on hump day. You know, it's a nice middle of the week. It just becomes this oasis in the middle of the week. Almost everything, I kind of scheduled it around not only when I could control it, but it also lined up with what was already available that I could do. You know, getting up early in the morning was kind of pushing things. Um, and the reality is, if you look at those things, and I've got my one thing right in the middle of the day, if Gus is sick and I have to take him home, that immediately becomes my one thing that day. That's what every parent would say, right? And so right. you just you lose that day of writing, and I'll go back to my calendar, and I'll steal back that four hours from something else. I'll just go and I'll cancel something that I was doing that was a lesser priority or just kind of a nice to have. It's like Downton Abbey. You know, I know I would love that show, but I just don't have time in my life to fit in four seasons of some show that I've never watched right now. And it's more important for me to be up in my bedroom reading a book to my kids at night than it is to be sitting in front of the TV and watching that show. I'll get to it eventually. I'm sure I will. I love TV and I love movies, but just not now. So you just kind of make the sensible choice. You know, I've got to make a choice between these two. What's more important to me? Okay. Then... If I still got to do that other thing, I just got to find time to do it. Jay, man, I really appreciate you coming on. Every time I, I sit and listen to this, and I'm actually disappointed I'm not going to get a chance to see you do this at Mega Camp. It, it um, kind of reinvigorates me to 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 stay focused. So, thanks for for doing this. I, I again, I just I really appreciate it. Hey, I appreciate you having me on your network. I love Active Rain, and I'm so appreciative of everybody who uh, tuned in today. Cool. Well, hey, you guys, uh, thank you for joining us. It looks like you got, if, if you're not focusing on your one thing, you now have some kind of practical advice on, on how to go about doing that. And, and hopefully this was, um, was something that, that you could, you know, pull something away from. And I, I mean, if you were listening, I don't think you have any question that you, you were able to get something out of this. We will have the recording available. If a bunch of you guys have been asking about the recording, um, 
Jay, we had some really good feedback, and, and people really seem to like this. So thanks again for doing this. You guys have an awesome uh, rest of your week, and we'll see you again real soon at Active Rain University. On behalf of Jay, uh, Carrie, Michelle, who are always behind the scenes, bye-bye, everybody.